Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, good night, wherever you're coming from. I am Edson Agati, founder and CEO of Hayek Global College. Uh, today, we're, we're rebooting our Profit Talks podcast in a format which is not just podcast. We're doing it live. So we're very excited here today. We have uh, Felipe Pessoa. Felipe is uh, my co-host today. He's an attorney, LLM in criminal law, alumni of Hayek Global MBA, and currently is a chief of staff at the Secretariat of Economic Monitoring in the Ministry of Economy in Brazil. Welcome, Felipe. Thank you very much, Edson. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here. It's good to see you two again. Hello again, Professor Burke. Very Hello, good to see you time. again. All right. I'm introduced Burke now, and then I'll go to the introduction. So Burke is our guest today, and he's the head of an international investigative firm specializing in asset recovery, due diligence, anti-money laundering, and intellectual property matters. For nearly three decades, he has worked as a knowledge specialist in international finance, due diligence, working in projects over 100 countries. Mr. Files is a highly sought out international speaker and author of several books, including the due diligence for the financial professional. He's also, of course, a founding professor <clears throat> of Hayek Global College and a member of the, our advisory board. So please welcome Burke Files. Hello, Burke. Thank you. All right, we're gonna go through a quick intro and we'll be right back with our talk, all right? Give us one second and... Ladies and gentlemen, may I have... Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? This is a global transmission. Hayek will be live in 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, Two, one, enjoy the show. <clears throat> and we're back. So, Burke, tell us, what does it take to become an international financial investigator? I've been asked that question many times over my career. And the only answer I can give, which is probably the truth, is I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> I, you know, I, I started out in college wanting to be uh, a doctor or a veterinarian, and I was tanked by organic chemistry. So I took some classes in um, agriculture and figured I could get my degree in, in the business of agriculture. And uh, I failed. I had a very poor advisor. She failed to tell me I'd have to transfer colleges. So uh, I left uh, Arizona State University needing only 126 hours to graduate with 146 hours. <laughs> but I was working full time um, through the College of Agriculture. I got an internship at a commodity futures brokerage and uh, actually stayed at that brokerage for three and a half years. Uh, I, I really enjoyed working with the clients. Um, doing hedging for the cattle, cocoa, cotton, and then began to work with the financial commodities. Um, I left that. Um, one of the first life's learning lessons is I had to sue my employer because he was a fraudster. <laughs> Followed that by uh, some independent work on helping companies look for and raise capital. Uh, was recruited by an investment banking firm here in Phoenix and became the, uh, the head of the uh, uh, unit that found opportunities and did the due diligence and homework on them. Uh, along the way, we were pushed into two arbitrations that for some reason um, a client had invested and they were, they were claiming that they were unsuitable for the investment. And... <clears throat> The arbitration I remember most closely was a woman who had invested um, $250,000 into a company called Phase Medical. Uh, I too had invested every penny I had in that company. 
and we all bought in at 20 cents a share. Well, the, the dispute came in, and I had a full background on her. We went into the arbitration, and the gentleman who was deposing me was a gentleman by the name of Sheldon Mitchell, an attorney. And he said, well, Mr. Files, where's your due diligence? And I brought a big box. And he says, oh, there are four file folders. There are four three-ring binders in here. Is one for each of us? He said, no, sir. This is all of the due diligence. You can copy what you like. And he did. He gave this big, heavy, pregnant sigh. And after a half hour of questioning, the arbitrator started to laugh and said, Mr. Mitchell, your claim is denied. Mr. Files, no one ever does this amount of due diligence. Um, later, um, a couple of months later, uh, Becton Dickinson uh, bought out Phase Medical, not at 20 cents a share, but 86 cents a share. So it was a big hit for everyone. And literally as I was leaving the investment banking firm, not because of anything other than not getting paid, the owner had a cocaine habit and sniffed the salaries and rent money and all that other stuff. I got a call. <clears throat> it was the last call I took at that firm. I said, Mr. Files, you seem to be pretty good at this due diligence stuff. How are you at financial investigations? And I said, I honestly have no idea, but I have a lot of free time on my hand. <laughs> So I went into their offices, took a look at a divorce case. In one week of work, I took a man from being broke with 15 checking accounts to over a period of time, he was worth around $20 million and had 186 checking accounts we could find. And in the middle of all of the litigation, that was my first death threat. <laughs> but he made the misfortune of doing it in court. His wife told me when he gets nervous or lies, his nostrils flare. Well, I'm giving testimony and his nostrils are going in and out like a concertina, like an accordion. And I started to laugh. That's when he got mad at me. <laughs> and I just continued thereafter. Go ahead, Philippe. You can ask. Yeah, it was, I, I found that story fascinating, especially the, the part that you got the call and you said, I, I have no idea. This is the, this is, this is the very first time. Mm -hmm. And it, when, when, when you, when you mentioned, I remember that, uh, as you know, uh, I had the honor of being uh, a student for Burke uh, for uh, three months. And you basically set your standards for, um, for what we should be, uh, our, should be our principles when we're doing due, due diligence is to see where are there problems in communications between mm -hmm. the, inside the corporation and between people. In that first moment, when you did the, the, the so much of due diligence and when you were beginning, you, did you also had that hint in your head? Was, was this something that you were kind of having intuition? How did you know? That the problem was communication uh, from the very beginning. I didn't. I, I, I didn't. Um, that's a revelation later in life. Um, you know, I remember one of the first private due diligence assignments I had was for an investment banker here in town, uh, Senpac Securities, long since gone. And I was looking into a company called Go Video. And that was a company that had two VCRs, so you could record from one tape to another tape. And the company was well-funded, but it was, it was, the money was all going to litigation in defense of their patents. The uh, music industry was trying to get rid of them. Copyright infringement was too easy. And I was given a very nice retainer. I went up to the business. Uh, and in the spot, in a covered spot with a monogrammed parking, I don't know what you call those things, you, the thing that keeps the car from running into the wall, the parking lot bumper, <clears throat> with a Maserati. And I walked around the business for a few minutes and I uh, went back to Senpac Securities, refunded 80% of my retainer. And I said, there's not enough money that you can put into this business that will ever be a success. And uh, I remember the fellow, Carl Phillips, he said, you're not here to make investment decisions. You're here to make sure he's not a phony. I said, well, he is. <laughs> but 
but that was that was also my first experience of never mind the facts. I've made my decision. Support my decision. And um, they underwrote uh, Go Video. I think it was at eight dollars a share, and they were bankrupt within a year and a half. And it's not one of those things like, oh, gee, I'm the smartest guy in the room. I'm not. Um, but I seem to have an innate ability to see what isn't going to work. Um, what really got me hooked was that first case, and there was a follow-up case reconstructing the estate of a gentleman who passed away. He was a brilliant venture capitalist. I learned a lot going through his records about optionality and how to control very large outcomes with very small amounts of money. <laughs> and I was, I think it was married about a year and a half. And the FedEx came to my door, handed me an envelope, and I opened it up. And it was a stock certificate for something called Wheeler Brader Technologies. And I'm going, why do I have this? And then I realized that was one of the options that the venture capitalist had. And when I communicated with them, they issued the stock in my name, not the estate's name. So I faxed it to the attorney and the client. <clears throat> That's how long ago it was. I faxed it. And uh, What year was that, approximately? Oh, God, that's got to be 83? No, 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 no. No, it's got to be uh, 93. Okay. I was born already. <clears throat> so the attorney calls me up. He goes, my God, you know, that's, that's $270,000 worth of stock. Do I send a Brinks truck? He told the attorney, Bob, no, it's $2.7 million. You've got a decimal problem. He goes, Christ, and it's issued in your name? How did this happen? I have no idea, Bob, but I'll drop it off tomorrow. Really? I said, Bob, both you and the client know I have it. I'm bringing it in. And that level of honesty um, really began a client being one of my greatest champions, telling that story over and over again. Um, as my wife comes home, what is, what's the stock certificate? Why is it in your name? How much is it worth? Yeah, that's she's blunt. <laughs> and uh, I told her, and she goes, "Eh, it'd be stolen money. It's not enough to run away with." It's like, come on, dear. <laughs> but you know, it's it's, it's it wasn't mine. <clears throat> so, and both of those cases uh, really got me hooked on the joy of unwinding a mystery and it is a joy trying to figure out um, what happened how it happened um, to be able to document it in such a way that instead of just knowing what happened that it can be proved in a court of law not getting information that is somehow tainted it's hard what, what what did you do before due diligence, Berg? What was your first job? <laughs> it was in high school. I worked in a greenhouse and I cleaned offices. I loved it. And then um, when I was going to school, I did all sorts of odd jobs. You know, I, I, I remember doing some work as a pastry chef uh, for a while. I also helped move pool tables. Um, I bought and sold a landscaping company. I reorganized uh, a bus company. You so you, you were what a, you need to. You bought and sold the landscaping company. I didn't mm -hmm. never heard of that one. So you, you were a, an entrepreneur in the landscaping business, as I understand. Yeah, it it, it worked really well. Actually, I, I did it with two companies. Uh, one I bought and sold, and the other one I founded and sold. And how was that experience? Um, it was a tough time. It was after I left um, the commodity futures company. There was a, a year and a half gap in there. I had to find something to do. And since I didn't have a bachelor's at that time, people weren't hiring some guy who didn't have a bachelor's. So <clears throat> I did what I could and it did quite well. Now, as a person who's allergic to grass, mold, trees, pollen, I sneezed a lot. 
Did you know you were allergic before? Oh, you yeah. Them? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> but you, you work with what you have. And I had a small amount of money, got a truck and some other stuff together. And it's amazing what happens when, as a landscaping company, you show up and you do the work when you say you're going to do it. People call you back. <clears throat> Did, and so you, you told us how, how you made the jump to do diligence and the mm -hmm. amazing stories that happened there. Did your experience as an entrepreneur in any way help you or shaped how you are as a professional Yeah. when you became a due diligence expert? Very much. If it's up to you, it's up to you. When you start a business, you're, you, make, you make all the CEO decisions and then afterwards you go clean the toilets. And, and I'm not joking. Uh, when we took over, the bus company had, uh, I can't remember, we'll say uh, 30 pieces of rolling stock, trolleys, big buses, little buses. And at any given point in time, <clears throat> 20 of them were sitting in the yard. And that, that's an asset not working. So I worked with the team there, and I, I remember um, a couple of them. And the objective was to get every piece of equipment rolling on my birthday. And my birthday was four months off. And for the three days before my birthday, I, I, I did not sleep for three days. And I was changing tires, alternators, fixing the vehicles. And I was literally covered head to toe in grease. And... Um, Investment banker came by that day, looked at me dead in the eye. Excuse me, sir. Can you show me where Mr. Files is? I said, hi, Phil. He goes, oh, my God, what happened to you? <laughs> <clears throat> and some of the investors really got it and, and uh, invested. And some of the others said, he's obviously not running a good shop if he has to do that work. Like, no, there was a goal. And that goal was ever piece of working stock out on the road. And we made it. We made it. But there was also something that I was wondering since the very uh, since I, since I, uh, I was back your student and it comes back in this conversation, this this thing that you you teach us the principles you teach us uh, we, we see these cases we mm -hmm. we see how people um, act uh, uh, in when when they're becoming fraudsters and but there's one thing. How do you, we have the theory, we have the, these principles, how do you update? I mean, how do you, because uh, the world is changing. You talk about this, uh, this era of information, you talk about this sensitive information, and how do we, how do you, when you see these new technologies, and, and presumably you see these new types of frauds uh, and how to cover up them, how do you update, how you get, how you, to take that sharp wit with you in, in these new experiences? You look at the individuals, and it doesn't matter whether you're talking about uh, selling the, the Union Army bad mules or you're selling an investor a bad stock. <clears throat> I'm keenly interested in how that individual behaves and what the individual record of that person is. Companies don't make money or lose money. Management makes the money or loses it. The individual <clears throat> is incredibly important. And so is the collective behavior of a, of a group within a business or investors or what management circle. Um, the more kowtowed they are, the more afraid they are to speak up to power, the more I know there's something wrong. You know, you take a look at, I, mean, I had this client for many years. He loved to buy businesses. He'd call me up. He'd say, Mark, go take a look at this business. That was my assignment. And I'd get a call about an hour after I visited the business. He goes, well, how big is it? And I would give him a number. <clears throat> And people wanted to know for years, what was that number? I said, that was the number of pages in the employee policy manual. <laughs> the more pages there were, I'm serious, the more pages there were, the happier he was. And he understood that 
every time something happens management doesn't like, they put it in the policy manual. So obviously they're managing by exception. So the thicker the employee policy manual, the crappier the management. And if my count was over 75, he was overjoyed. One time it was over 150. He was ecstatic. <laughs> he said, the larger the pay count, the, the, the greater the profitability and the turnaround. <laughs> I, I love that. I love that insight. Um, that was his, not mine, but I'm stealing it. <laughs> no, it's 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 fantastic. Um, just taking a step back, if you think about it, it's what some private equity funds do, right? I, I have this experience uh, at uh, my family's business where we had a similar situation. <clears throat> We were in a bad, badly managed company, and uh, it was profitable for someone to get in there and simply change what we were doing. And it's a common theme throughout business. And that insight you bring is—it's uh, a way to see a signal in a very subtle thing, which is the amount of policy they have in the compliance menu. And oh. it, it's very powerful. I thought I thought it was very powerful. Just how it, subtle it is. It was very accurate, too. <laughs> <clears throat> no, but it's, it's, it's the people that matter. It really is the people that matter. And if they're constantly hemmed in with an employee manual, what is that manual there for? It's a tool to make wrong. That's a tool to make the employee wrong. Or conversely, for the employee to make management wrong. It's not, it's, it's often not a tool of guidance, but of discipline. And that doesn't go over well. Eventually <clears throat> people get tired and they just show up. They're just punching the clock. And a devo demotivated workforce is a very expensive uh, liability. Burke, let's say, let's say if <clears throat> someone wants to become people watching us now are curious and <clears throat> how, okay. I'm, I, may, I might be looking at a career change. I, I might be um, you know, here hanging out on LinkedIn and see, see what type of opportunities there are. And people might be curious, what, what is the career of a financial investigator like? Um, is there good prospects for people? What, like, is there good money in, in this, this type of business as a consultant of financial investigation? How, how is it like? Um. There's not great money as an independent firm. There, is, there are great rewards. I've made a positive difference in some people's life and others I've helped send to jail and recover money for the investors. Um, I think if you're on a career path, you would do well to associate with a larger firm um, and really become a polymath meaning learn many things, not just about assets, but about life. Um, I think also, and you must realize, <clears throat> we discussed this in class, is that an accountant and an auditor is a part of the tool basket. So is someone who understands law. So is someone who understands operations. But then you have to have someone who is has a broad enough set of skills to manage a team that's conducting the due diligence or manage a team that's conducting the investigation. And you know that's where I try to to steer my students' thought process. It's not um, I'm a financial investigator, I'm a I'm an accountant. <clears throat> well, that's not enough, quite frankly. What happens if you're looking at uh, the, the building a road? What does an accountant know about building a road? He can do the cost, he or she can do the cost of materials and labor and the lifespan of the road, but so what? What if you're supposed to pour a four inch thick reinforced concrete slab? What does the accountant know about concrete or slabs or pouring? Nothing, you need a subject matter expert. And this is where every good due diligence <clears throat> Um, assignment and every good asset recovery assignment is a team. No one, no one has all the knowledge. 
<clears throat> I can't tell you how many times I've walked into a conference room with attorneys and accountants, and I'll hear that. I know exactly what's going on. At that point in time, I know we're in trouble. Because only the fraudster knows what's exactly going on. Um, and, you know, you got to speak up. And sometimes speaking up isn't liked. In a particular case, the accountants, it was in New York, and I remember it well. The accountant said, well, based upon this and talking with the attorneys, we should be able to recover $22 million for the uh, woman. I said, well, it's a divorce case. They go, right. And here we have an audited financial statement for $44 million. I said, well, you should probably require, recover close to about $32 million. And the anger of being corrected just came out at me like a bullhorn. And I said, well, you know, if you'd actually read, you know, your auditors, if you'd read the financial statement, you look back in the back, it's in, it's in British pounds sterling, not dollars. <clears throat> they all go out in the hallway and start fussing at one another. And the attorney elbows me, you know, you're going to get fired. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, <clears throat> yeah, you, you just got to speak up. Cool. I think Felipe went sideways here. I don't know if he's still with us or if something happened with his, with his internet. It's normal technical details. We're live, so things might happen like that, right? Exactly. <laughs> um, uh, one of the things that it was kind of in the pre-prepared questions you sent over for us to think about go ahead. was um, career advice. Well, I looked up online, you know, gee, what's good career advice? And you have to say, have a goal, have a plan. You must decide on a path. Seek balance every day. But none of that works. You know, I had a goal of being a doctor. So if I didn't make the goal as being a doctor, what should I do? Go in a corner and cry? No, you got to buck up and keep going. You know, there's a thing called grit. <clears throat> And you have to make it, sometimes you just have to make your own opportunities. Is it uncomfortable? Yes. Can you fail? Absolutely. You know, I spent a year and a, about a year and a half in the wilderness after I left the commodity futures firm because I was suing my former employer because he was a fraudster. I was blackballed from the industry. So what do you do? You start working. Um, really... The key is learning to think. And, and learning to, and finding a circle of friends and professionals that you can have intelligent conversations with. I mean, that's one of the joys I have with, with Hayek and the students. You know, it's an intelligent conversation every time. There's push, there's pull, there's insight, there's confusion. I mean, it's, it's, it's really cool. I know that's a dorky thing to say, but it's really cool. <laughs> um, and I also remember uh, a company that I was hired to do a due diligence on, and I was speaking to the soon-to-be former manager. <clears throat> he was very intelligent. He had a Harvard MBA. And he said, you know, Mr. Files, I screwed up. He said, when I looked at this company and where it was going, I thought it was, I thought it was um, story problem A not story problem B. And I froze. I froze on the spot because here's this great brand image for Harvard. And I have a manager that's managing by a checklist of story problems. That was utterly frightful. I mean, that's one of the things in the due diligence book. Do we need checklists? Yeah, but but consider them thought lists because a checklist can only go over every possible thing that ever happened before. Checklists cannot look into the future. <clears throat> checklists work well for something that is static, repeatable, almost dogmatic, if you will, like starting up an airplane. What are the things you have to do to start up an airplane? Cool. It's every business is different and the checklists are a guide, not the path. I'm sorry, I went off on checklists. A checklist are, are useful. They're, they're a tool, but you probably wouldn't want to stick 
to the checklist as the, the whole entire truth of anything that you're doing. You're right. And I can't tell you how many times I've walked into a bank that had a money laundering or compliance problem. And I go into the operations people and they go, well, I followed the checklist. Yes, I know you did. And I, I think just this, just another thought until I, I, I let Felipe um, ask and, and go for these <clears throat> questions. Um, I'm biased, of course, but I, I believe there's a lot of uh, underappreciation for the insights that Hayek bring. And it has to do with that, you know, um, understanding that we live in a chaotic world and that things change and that things are very different from one situation to the other. And that a grandmaster, like Hayek was speaking about a grandmaster plan, right? It's very, it's impossible to, to, to think about every single situation. And it goes to these insights of, you know, using checklists. If you think it's possible to plan everything, or if you don't understand that the world is chaotic and things change all the time and things are different from one setting to the other, um, you might be inclined to think that you are able to, to see the world through a checklist or through a master plan, which is impossible. And it, it's the insight that I bring to you. Yeah, I have a book somewhere behind me in this mass of mess. <clears throat> um, it's the American Management Association Complete Due Diligence Checkbook uh, book, checklist book. It is almost three inches thick, huge book. And the gentlemen and ladies have put it together. It's a tour de force, but it's useless. Every it's, it's it is absolutely useless. It's a tour de force, but it's useless. Um, I, 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 there was something someone said, and if I could remember who they were, I'd tell you. But we're educating people today to use technology that has yet to be invented in jobs that do not yet exist. So. You, you've got to you've got to train them how to think, to be and, curious, to challenge. And it's always going to be like that. It always was like that, and it's always going to be like that. <clears throat> yeah, you look at was it between two thousand one and two thousand and two. Um, in one year, more information was created than than ever had been created in the history of man. It was, it was a one-year gap with this technology we're now enjoying here um, on our desktops from literally, what, two continents. Amazing. It is. <clears throat> it really is. And um, I've been lucky through my travels uh, to learn that we're a lot more similar than we are different. A lot more similar. You know, every family wants their children to do better than they did, to be healthy and <clears throat> to, to live a good life. I mean, that's a universal uh, truth. And people are happy, you know, paying a little tax and submitting to a little regulation, but then it gets too heavy and then they start fussing at the government. So, again, another universal truth. <laughs> Very true. Um. Burke, I have uh, also one question. I, I guess this is the the uh, this this might be a, a, a little personalistic, and sometimes it, it might be a bit stereotypical too. But I always wanted to ask you this question: Is there something that you always work with? I mean, is there something that you cannot skip work without? I mean, uh, a tool. Or, uh, for example, for example, your your personal ceremony of doing something is there something that is embedded in what you do that you think it helps? There are two things I do. Um, <clears throat> when I'm speaking, either on the computer like today, or in person like I used to do before the virus, mm. is <clears throat> to wake up early, have a bite to eat. You know, shower, groom well, put on some cologne, and then be presentable. <clears throat> I know you don't smell over the internet, but, you know, I kind of like the cologne. It's, it's, it's a ritual. <laughs> and the other ritual, every time I open up a file folder, and I still have hard file folders, I open up the file folder, and I said, <clears throat> and I'll say, you know, 
I'm an idiot. But with grace and diligence, I can overcome that natural tendency. <clears throat> and that's, that's really, those are the two, two things I do. Crazy. Yeah. I, 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 this, oh, okay. So, sorry, no, no, go on. I was just going to. No, no, you, you're going to correlate to that. It's because uh, every time that I think about some sort of professional ritual, it is is a way for you to. Um, I get that a lot when we're talking about uh, back in at, at the specialization and <clears throat> and in law school, when we're talking about compliance, we talk a lot about checklists. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. oh. It went sideways again. <laughs> no, we can't, no, I can't hear you. <laughs> no, we can't hear you. It's okay. I, okay I can take he's, go out. he's going out and he's coming back in. <laughs> See you soon. He's, you know, he's right talking about um, compliance and checklists. Um, you have someone <clears throat> a checklist is is often a tool used to get someone who is not familiar with the topic to be able to dig into a topic it's it's like a recipe <clears throat> i can go into the kitchen and cook i don't need a recipe but my wife is not familiar with cooking. So she needs to have and follow a recipe. So as we're saying, Felipe, that you know, checklist is there to familiarize a person who's not knowledgeable in an area to become somewhat functional in that area. Um, like a recipe for cooking. If you don't know how to cook, you go get a recipe and see if you can follow it. Yeah, uh, let me just add to that. I, in my day-to-day -day management, I, I like uh, checklists. Um, for example, we're running this live, and we're going to do a couple of things after this live, which I know are going to be routine. Uh, we're going to engage online. We're going to put uh, post on Facebook. We're going to cut uh, some edits of the video, etc., 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 and. Now, I, I've come up with that before. Oh, there we go, mm -hmm. Felipe again. And I, I've come up with that before, and it's a useful reminder that uh, so I don't forget things that I, I have. You know, there's standard things that goes through. Uh, <clears throat> however, there are certain things that cannot be put in a checklist. For example, with what we're talking right now, mm -hmm. the conversation can go in any direction. So... It's well, I mean, that's, that's, that's managing your time. I have my, my, usually my long list of large tasks that have to be done. And then I have these little note cards reminding me of what are the, the smaller tasks needed to accomplish that macro task. Yeah. So I guess the problem is if it's not using checklist per se, but if you take the checklist as the end and all, you know, this is everything I need is the checklist. And if people don't think beyond the checklist, that's, uh, I guess, where, where we run into problems. Huh? Well, yeah, I'll, I'll give you an example of a checklist gone bad. Uh, I was doing some work for the Asian Development Bank. I was part of a team helping develop the anti-money laundering laws for the country of Pakistan. We had people going in and out of London, Uzbekistan, and Pakistan. The money was being wired from the Philippines to the United States, and I was wiring money to London, Uzbekistan, and Pakistan. The final payment from the Asian Development Bank was red flagged and my account frozen. And I called up, I said, what's going on? This is the third or fourth payment. We've not had a problem before. Where's Marcy, my customer service? Oh, she's on maternity leave. I said, well, I handed her a copy of the contract and the guidelines so she knew exactly what we were doing. She goes, but these are all red flag countries. I know. We're helping to write the anti-money laundering laws. Well, who's your payee? I said, the payee is the Asian Development Bank. And you hear this clicky clack of the computer board. I find no commercial bank named Asian Development Bank. 
I said, well, it's part of the World Bank, clicky clack. I find nothing tied to the World Bank. This is part of the UN. The UN doesn't have a bank. Ah! <laughs> Stupidest bank on the planet. And, you know, we laugh now, but I was censured from the uh, Asian Development Bank for uh, a year, essentially ending all the work we had done, because my subs complained that I didn't pay them and they didn't believe my story. You know, it took a month and a half to free the money up and pay everyone. So that's a checklist gone rogue that ruined a business. And sitting in a, <clears throat> a bank in Boston, uh, someone had written a check that had never written a check for that amount before. And I was an advisor to it. And one of the compliance people comes in, oh, Mr. Files, this is money laundering. What is it? It's a $42,000 check. I said, okay. What's the crime? Money laundering is moving money tied to a crime. Well, it's got to be a crime. Why? Well, the computer red flagged it. Ah, let me get the, look at the gentleman's file folder. The gentleman was 60, I think 63 or 64 years of age. And you just have to Google who the check was written to. It was a car dealership. <clears throat> I called him up. I said, this is Burke Files with XYZ Bank. He goes, oh, you're calling about the check. Yeah, I got a call. I said, I only have a question. I said, you got a truck, right? He goes, yeah. I said, a pickup truck, right? He goes, yeah. And I said, did you get red? He says, no, my wife made me get white. She said, red was too showy. It was his retirement gift to himself. You know, that's not money laundering. <clears throat> so while a checklist may not get everything you want, and we know that to be the case, it can also horribly misinform you and waste a lot of time. You know, AI is almost intelligent. I've never seen a bunch of algorithms or multiple solution matrices that can think. You know, it takes, you, you tell a five-year-old what a school bus looks like, and he's able to identify a school bus. A computer with an algorithm will require five, 10, 15,000 photos to be able to do that. So there's got to be a place for the human element. It's very true, very deep. <clears throat> Felipe, on you. Sorry about the come and go, guys. This is absolutely infuriating. I have no idea what's happening. It's not a connection. Uh, Burke, I, I, I also have uh, something about uh, prospection on, on this field. Um, if I were to become a due diligence officer, and this is becoming something that is being uh, very demanded uh, here in, uh, in Brazil and Latin America as a whole, um, what would you be your first advice, for example? Uh, I, I'm I'm, start, I, I'm exactly in that moment in your life. Someone calls you up. Uh, I, I, you, say, I, you say, okay, I, I'm interested in this, but I have never worked in this before. Uh, what, what would you be your first advice? I like to say, read my book. Um, and that, that's self-serving, but that book came about because I got tired of seeing frauds. Mm -hmm. I, I could look across the room and see that someone is, is full of stuffing. And here are people, intelligent people, running up to give these people checks for two, three, four hundred thousand dollars $400,000. And I want to know what is that ability for a con man or woman to be able to get that out of people? What is the misapplied ability for someone to start a company and crash it. And that's, that's really where the due diligence book was born was out of a frustration that some of these, I'm hoping that some of you people out there reading the book, get the point that we're not all saints. In fact, we're far from it. And that there are a lot of things that set up such as unchecked power uh, or unchecked authority that lead to mischief. Um, and the second is to assemble a good team. You need to have the resources to, to have a good team. And your senior management has got to let you go, not tell you how you're going to do the due diligence. I remember working on an oil field case, going out to Oklahoma, and I have the team together. And the wise old engineer told me, he said, Burke, don't, don't just grab a lot of paper because they're going to buy this oil company. 
So what we're doing is done diligence, not the due diligence. We just need to fill a filing cabinet with paper so it looks like we did something. Ouch. <clears throat> you know, for the company, the acquisition went well. Thank, thank goodness. But that was that's not the purpose of the due diligence. The due diligence is not to find a risk-free investment. It's to be able to identify those risks and you make a conscious decision whether you choose them or not. And you never have 100% of the information. That's impossible. So you have to make a, an efficacious choice. How much do I gather? How fast do I gather? What matters? Um, on a $20 million deal, attorneys at $400 an hour should not be going over copier leases, which have a maximum liability of $60,000. Who cares? What's the outcome in a change of ownership? Either they keep leasing the copiers or the leasing company demands payment in full. Who cares? <laughs> Honestly. <clears throat> so part of that is just finding what matters. And uh, let's say in a more personal skill level, right? So Filippi is a lawyer today. Mm -hmm. Um I guess that there's, as you said, due diligence is not necessarily one. We want to need one type of set, skill set. It's it's actually a multidisciplinary. Yes, uh, it is. <clears throat> type of uh, endeavor. So you can have accountants, lawyers, even engineers, or um, absolutely. Others. Uh, and looking at Felipe today, he's a lawyer. Uh, he has an LLM, criminal justice, has an MBA. Like, what type of skill set would he need to develop? Uh, to work as a due diligence consultant, let's say? Um, team building. Um, using his MBA to understand how quick you can do a job and how to divide that job up in the, in the quickest way possible. Um, <clears throat> we do a lot of uh, background checks on members of the board of directors of large companies, public companies, or large private companies. And it's always the same thing. You have to check your references, check the degree, check for litigation, all those fun things. The first thing we do is we start checking the references. Why? Because those take the longest. <clears throat> you know, verifying degrees and background and litigation, you know, we can do in four or five days. But if you do all of that, then you start doing the checking the references you know, you're, you're going to take an investigation that should take a week. It's going to take three weeks. Uh, so you want to get the stuff that takes the longest done first. I mean, that's just an, an example of managing a case. Um, also understanding that, as we discussed in the, in the class, there are fatal flaws. <clears throat> There's some things that you just stop. Um, was looking into a company... Um, in, of all places, Puerto Rico. <clears throat> After about an hour of work, I called the client. I said, he has two felony convictions for financial fraud. Is this a fatal flaw? And they said, yes, it is. Okay, <laughs> I'm done. It's an hour time, done. Um, another was investing with a gentleman who was running family offices. He claimed to have a Harvard MBA. You know, he had, he had one on his wall, but you can buy those for 150 bucks. A big part of it, as I see, um, is something that I, I've talked about in my commencement speech, is, which is, you know, at the same time being humble, but also understanding that no one has the superpowers and that you should check everyone. As, as you have a great quote, Brooke, that I remember, uh, an insight, right, that you, I think you bring in your book where, you know, uh, people are do so so diligent in checking, doing the background checks of truck drivers, but they don't do anything about the doctors, you know, the nope. ones that are doing the surgeries and, and the patients. And <clears throat> maybe there's a guy who was drinking the night before and has to do a brain surgery on a, a patient the next day. And no, and no one checks because that guy has, you know, power, has the... There's nothing more credible than putting a doctor in front of your name and embroidering it on a lab coast. 
just um, by itself it gives the, 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 them an, a, a special power that people are afraid of touching yeah it's it's <clears throat> you know, he's a doctor oh my goodness um there's a story in the united states and and in africa of a gentleman by the name of michael swango who was a doctor and also a mass murderer used his position as a doctor to kill people yeah <laughs> I think the book was written about it was Michael Swango, and I think it was called Blind Eye or something like that. Yeah, and, and you, you're going to see that in judges and uh, professors mm -hmm. and any, anyone that uh, is, is in a, a position which has special privileges or special powers just because people see it that way. But in the end, everyone's human. Yes, we are. Inescapably human. Inescapably human. You know, and that's... I put together a list of books that I thought were really some of the best books I've ever read. And the beginning was all about humanities, going back to the, um, the Greek and the Roman plays, uh, Homer, um, <clears throat> Aeschylus. I mean, here are people from hundreds, thousands of years ago that are writing, that are still writing in such a way that we, we relate to it you know, two millennia later. Um, there was another um, book that we still, we still refer to, even in modern conversations today, The Code of Hammurabi. So we've evolved. We, we weren't engineered in a lab sometime in the post-World War II. We as human beings have evolved, and our behavior has evolved. And there are many different personalities <clears throat> along with this evolution. And thinking that we can escape our humanity is a fool's errand. Filippi. Um, Brick, uh, is there something in the, uh, unfortunately, I, I missed part of uh, of your answer uh i have no idea what's happening uh, <laughs> to this device right here uh but uh, let's say in this in this um in this field uh what was your most uh i mean i i don't want i i don't want to narrow it down to one case specifically but what's the the most uh because you 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 deal a lot with not only with information but how people react this is your this is your main cue as you said but what is the the, the thing that is most difficult about uh due diligence uh is is a, a acquiring information is going after the the uh, the hints or something uh what is what's the most challenging about it There, there's two answers to that. Uh, one is after years of doing this, um, there's some people that think they just still don't need your information or your assistance. And the flip side of that is based upon the years of experience and information I have, <clears throat> I can see the pain that they're going to suffer. And it's not, it's not an if, it's a when. Uh, working with a charity that lost you know, many hundreds of thousands of dollars to a treasurer who was a signal signatory on the account. I recommended to this charity throughout the nation that they should make sure that there are two signatures on the account. And the head of that branch, that chapter, also has access to see the account. I was told that's not needed. It's just a matter of time before more frauds are found or occur. It's... it's, it's and the other was a case that was from here. I was referred to a gentleman who was a, a CPA, an accountant, and he wanted me to look into his ex-wife. <clears throat> he had married young and foolishly when he lived in Southern Illinois, as he said, <clears throat> and he and his second wife, now of some, I don't know, 20 years, a lovely couple, he said, my wife's telling me I need to investigate the woman I divorced <clears throat> because she's got to have money. 
you know, her family always had money, money. They were farmers in Southern Illinois, blah, blah, blah. So I read the divorce decree. And after just two and a half years of marriage, he was required to pay her alimony. He had been paying her alimony for 28 years. He had a daughter, the daughter he had paid for all of her schooling, um, private high school, college, and she was doing very well. And the divorce decree said, you know, at any time that there's a significant change in anyone's assets, we must revisit this. And I did some research into this woman. And this woman inherited about three years after divorce or four years after divorce, just short of four sections of land in Southern Illinois. Do you know what a section is? 640 acres of prime farmland, even back then valued at over $2,000 an acre. That did not include some of the land in uh, Carbondale uh, in the city where the buildings were paying her land leases. She was worth somewhere in the neighborhood of four or five million dollars a couple of years after they divorced. And the judge here in Arizona, where the case was <clears throat> eventually dragged, the judge looked at the woman and said, you will pay back, Andre, every single dime plus 10% interest after for the <clears throat> for the 20 some odd years, you did not deserve alimony. It will bear 10% interest. You have one week to do it or I will put you in jail. The judge was furious. And uh, I was just like, yes, a great win. I looked over and Andre's crying. I said, I don't understand. He goes, I know, I know. I never missed an alimony payment. I never missed a payment for tuition. And I can't get back all of those years I was living in a single apartment cooking on a hot plate. I'd never thought of that. <clears throat> and uh, those, are the, those are the two items. Felipe, you get to watch that on the rerun. <laughs> It's okay. I think we should all do this for Felipe. Are you ready? <laughs> he missed it. Yes, he missed it. <laughs> He's going to see it in the replay. <laughs> um, I don't know. And one of the other questions you asked was, what was the best book I ever read? And I've been thinking about that all last night and today. Yeah, what is the best book you've ever read? You know, I'll call it a gateway book. <laughs> Like their gateway drugs, it's a gateway book, and it was called *The Discoverers* by Stan by Daniel Borstein, B O R S T I N. Excellent book. <clears throat> um, it's an older book, but it's it's about the voyage of discovery, how things were discovered, what important things were discovered. It's a fiction or nonfiction? Nonfiction. <clears throat> he was a former uh, librarian of Congress. And he wrote a couple of other books, and I, I forget what they are. They were all very good. I read all of them. But The Discoverers, uh, I picked up at a yard sale for, I think it was 50 cents, an old used copy of The Discoverers. And I read that. I've read it three times now. I mean, fascination about how they discovered time. Um, it's, just, it's just amazing. <clears throat> Is it about uh, a historical account of... People who discovered stuff uh, in the past? What is it? It's, it's, it's not only about people who discovered stuff, but the process of discovery. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> How failure, you, know, you have a hypothesis, failure teaches you something. You can't learn without failure. And how these people were so filled with grit and determination to figure out a problem. You know, what's, what's the name of the author again? So people here. Daniel Borstein, B O R S T E I N. This is why we have a computer behind me. Sure, we can look it up in Google. And I'm trying to do my best. Ah, two O's. Daniel Joseph Borstein, B O O R S T I N. And uh, <clears throat> Super. 
Yeah, he had uh, the Discovers, the Creators, the Americans, the Seekers. Uh, but the Discovers was the book that really made a big difference for me. Amazing. Yeah. Now, uh, just the last quick questions. What is your favorite movie? There's so many good ones. Um, you have to pick one. One? Secondhand Lions. Secondhand? I don't know that one, too. <laughs> <laughs> it's with Michael Caine and Robert Duvall. Secondhand Lions. What is it about? Got to watch it, man. Right. The opening scene is where a wayward niece... <clears throat> Or cousin drops off her son for these two old men to watch. And that's the opening scene. <clears throat> And uh, uh, <clears throat> always cry at the end. Secondhand Lions is his favorite movie, Felipe. Have you seen it? No, I haven't seen that one, but writing it down right now. <laughs> <laughs> To all the listeners out there, we have to watch it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just for that uh, for that review in the very end, we're going to discuss this in a minute. <laughs> Merck, is there anything that we should have asked you but we didn't? Um, yeah, and that, that's basically the progress of the career of an investigator. An investigator is there to find information that you don't know about. Um, or that's not easily found. I started my career chewing, shoe, chewing up shoe leather, going between courts, digging into places, going to peace, people's homes, taking garbage, all those romantic things. It was very valuable. Um, as technology changed, so did our ability to access information. So what I was able to do in the past in searching court records, you can do online now. You know, a clerk or a child can do it. So I've had to continually up my game to get information better, faster, and the information that's more difficult. And in doing that, it was part of building the international network of people. It was part of saying yes to assignments to go to places that aren't fun, like Haiti. Beautiful people, screwed up, foul, disgusting country. Um, you know, working on a project uh, to reduce uh, default rates for a development bank in Africa, traveling around Africa, trying to figure out why these loans were being defaulted on. Not easy, <clears throat> especially when you're, you're coming in and you're the wrong color, you're the wrong country, you're asking questions that about a failure and everyone's pointing fingers and you're trying to tell them, I don't care why it failed. This isn't... <clears throat> This isn't a legal investigation or an economic investigation. It's an operations. What do we do to make it not happen? How do we rescue the project? <clears throat> and, you know, it's, you've got to up your game. And your career is never static. Facts, facts you think may be static, but, man, you've got, you got to up it every day. Great. Great later stuff. today, later today, I get to learn about mining, a property that was supposed to have been sold, wasn't sold. Someone else wants to buy it, and apparently there's a mine on the site. So we got to go figure that one out. <laughs> Amazing. Well, Burke, it was an honor to speak with you again today. Thanks, uh, Charles. Felipe, thank you very much for being <clears throat> a co-host today in today's Profit Talks Live. We, we, tried to, we tried to support him in his problems of going horizontal, <laughs> but yeah, he left before like he this. could see the support. Yeah. No, know, there, there, there was a moment like like that. when it happened like the 10th time, I think you could, I, I couldn't hear you. I couldn't hear a word that you guys said, but I, but I saw that you could see me like this. <laughs> Sideways. <laughs> Sideways. You know? Life thank happens. We keep going. <laughs> But thank you again, Burke. Thank you no, very pleasure, much. pleasure, guys. Thank you very much. A great time. Thank you for everyone who watched us, and we'll see you next time.